Okay, so day two of the Maryland vlog. And we are here at the Bino Railroad Museum. So I'm gonna be bringing you some of the highlights from the museum. My mother is laughing at me. Yep. I don't know why. You're my entertainment. I am not entertainment. Oh, well, yeah, you are. Well, on, <laughs> on YouTube I am, but in real life, no. So, yeah, I will see you inside. Yeah, this day was an important moment in my life. I truly believed in the idea of a road made of rails. Okay. Commentary, but this is just so cool. Look at the detail. That's very that's awesome. The E prototype model. I'm seeing things.
Take notice in front of you uh, on either side of the car that we're traveling in. There are signs that say okay. north and south. If you look, that uh, we'll I'll be using those as indicators. We are heading west right now. Just to give you a little bit of direction. So the first thing I want to point out is coming up on the north side of the tracks. That we're in building there, nicely painted red building. That is the home of the Baltimore City Mounted Police Unit. It is the first and only continuously operating mounted police unit in the entire United States. That was built through a promise and agreement uh, between the museum and the mounted unit and several others. It was also one of our station stops, but unfortunately we are not stopping there today. It has eight stalls and is a state-of-the-art uh, facility that still does house several of the horses, the famous one being Bo. You can guess that that was shortened from B and O. We put the two letters together, bada boom, and get a name called Bo. <laughs> Just past there, that big concrete structure there with the pillars and beams, that is Tender Kitchen. Built in the late 1910s. That was built to uh, service as the name implies, steam locomotive tenders and various boxcars as well. In between those big pillars and beams of concrete, we used to sit glass blocks that would uh, allow natural sunlight to come in and also radiate heat as well. Wow. 
Still looking to the north side of the tracks there, that other red building with the uh, not so good looking cars out there. That is our restoration shop. After the roundhouse collapse, the roundhouse collapse in 2003, that shop was uh, erected in 2005, finished in 2005, and houses state-of-the-art equipment for our steam, diesel, and electric locomotive, as well as passenger car restoration. The number 51 that you saw in the roundhouse, that streamlined locomotive, that sat in there for well over two years as it went through a complete cosmetic restoration. On the south side of the tracks, that big mansion up on the hill here through the clearing, that is Mount Clare Mansion. That was built uh, for Charles Carroll the Barrister, not Charles Carroll the son of the Declaration of Independence, but Charles Carroll the Barrister, who was a very distant relative of Charles Carroll, the signer of the Declaration of Independence. And that was built and is reminiscent of the Georgian era of architecture. I guess everybody back then is named Charles Carroll. What we're running along now was the switch lead to get into uh, the B&O's Mount Clare shops, of which, again, we just left with the North and South car shops down there in the roundhouse. The area in which you were probably moseying around in were the um, G-Scale Garden and other stuff. They were huge, huge shops. Boiler shops, uh, what they call an erecting shop, where they could literally put locomotives together. They would cast parts and build several locomotives there. But unfortunately, as time moved on and the B&O switched from steam to diesel, those shops were no longer needed. Some of them caught fire and burned. What you see now there is, what is that? So, if we were to continue heading west, we would come to the switch that then takes us out onto the CSX, now CSX mainline, that then heads out to Ellington City. So, I tell you that to tell you this, after that first stone was laid in 1827, it took them three years to build those 13 miles. Again, this was in an era before uh, hydraulics and mass amounts of air tools were being used. All done by hand, all 13 miles out to uh, what's now called Ellicott City, back then called Ellicott Mills, it was all built by hand. And if you want to look on the south side of the track, that vacant track there, that is the original B&O mainline that heads out to Ellicott City. It also takes you, if you follow it on the map, would take you to Camden Station. You have to throw a couple switches, but you could get to Camden Station. So yes, that track on the south side, sometimes we come out here, we'll see a CSX uh, freight uh, train of intermodal, sometimes a trash train. We'll just sit there because this is also a crew change point for CSX as well. But today we are unfortunately not going to see anything on that track. Coming up on, on the north side, that is what used to be a naked field, is now a BGE substation. If you, were to, if you continue to look to the north side and west, so to the front of the, uh, the direction of movement here, there are several switches. Uh, that would take you out onto the streets in which cars would be switched out into different industries there on the north side. Some of those tracks are still there, and you can probably see them as we roll by. Again, on the north side of the track, we'll be stopping. Our, our stopping point here is the first mile the, the, the stone is sitting inside of a box so that first the stone that you see inside of the roundhouse was originally on the north side of the track here and it was found dug up brought back there but that was where charles carroll and the rest of his fellows put it into the ground there's now a green uh, graffiti box unfortunately that's sitting there so this concludes the end of the run if we are uh, csx has a derail up so we cannot head out onto their main line. But if we were, we would again head to Ellicott City and head have, or head over the Carrollton Viaduct, the first uh, railroad viaduct in the United States and is still in operation today.
president in the year 1900 for the Hocking Valley Railroad in Ohio, and later transferred to the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. The term combine was short for a combination car that served both as a passenger coach and a baggage car. Coaches like this were used on branch lines and countryside routes where passengers were few. This particular combine car retains segregated or separate sections for African American and white people. Please notice the buttons in front of you and follow along while I explain. Behind you is the baggage section. In this open area, passengers bags as well as packages and light freight is carried through country towns and stations along the route. Please push and hold the blue button. The lighted cabin before you was the main passenger cabin of this combine car. Please note the rich paneling, stenciled and decorated ceiling, mirror, and the gold leaf lettering. All of this was typical of railroad passenger coaches at the turn of the 20th century. Railroads strove to provide elegant accommodations that were decorated according to the fashion of the day. This cabin, however, was reserved for white and well-to-do passengers only. Please push and hold the green button. The middle compartment of this combine car was known as a partition section. Throughout the last decades of the 19th century and well into the 20th century, Many railroads strictly enforced racial segregation laws forcing African-American travelers to sit in separate but not equal sections. Please note that while the seats are the same in both sections, this compartment lacks much of the rich detail and decoration found in the white compartment. Smoking was also permitted in this section for both white and African-American passengers, thus contributing to an uncomfortable atmosphere. Racial segregation laws enacted in the late 19th century were known as Jim Crow laws, believed to be named after a song and dance parody of African Americans called Jump Jim Crow that surfaced in the 1830s. Over the years, railroad coaches like this were known as Jim Crow coaches. The first instance that challenged Jim Crow travel accommodations was not Rosa Parks on a Montgomery bus in the 1950s but rather a shoemaker by the name of Homer Plessy who took his case to court after being forced to ride in a black compartment on a Louisiana railroad coach in the 1890s. Plessy lost his case. However, the stage was set for decades of social and political argument over racial segregation in America. The official end to racial segregation and Jim Crow practices of the United States came with the Congress's passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964.
Dude, this is so cool. Oh, that shows the combustion. So I think red is where the... And then pushes us out through the exhaust. Is this, this valve is moving left and right. That's so cool. Guys, I found the original skateboard. I wonder what a kickflip would look like on this bad boy.
rồi Bye bye I'm waiting for it to get almost completely out of view. That didn't sound good. So that wraps up our day at the Railroad Museum. So if you made it this far in the vlog, comment train. Yeah, comment the word train. T-R-A-I-N. I did not want to look like an idiot, but that just made me look like more of an idiot. Forgetting how to spell. So I will see you tomorrow in the final vlog from Maryland. Peace out.